We, uh, I hope, are generous with our thanks to various people that make a, a lectureship successful. And it occurs to me that one of the thanks that uh, is due are, are for the men who come up and lead songs. And uh, particularly thank Brother Paul for that. I, uh, I have to admit a certain amount of envy of his voice. But uh, anyway, that's neither here nor there. Our next speaker is uh, Don Tarbett. Uh, <laughs> Oh, so I just couldn't resist. <laughs> now, before before I forget it, I have a piece of paper in my hand here to uh, to remind me because I am uh, recollection challenged, and uh, some of you may be too. So there are some little sheets of paper on on the table here in front. If you want to sign up for contending for the faith, here's the website. So it's, it's printed, and if you can fold that up, put it in your pocket, and then remember what you did with it, that's my problem. Well, Daniel has been introduced a couple of times already. I, uh, I did have an opportunity to uh, make a remark about Daniel, I, actually to, to Mike a while ago, and, and told Mike that uh, if uh, he ever needed... Uh, some uh, some help some some tutoring or whatever with the Greek Daniel's your man and uh, I guess uh, one of the highest compliments I can pay to him is that when uh, men in the Brotherhood get ready to debate they want Daniel at their side as a moderator and uh, I think that that stands uh, or speaks well for him so uh, I, I did one other thing occurred to me too. I, uh, I was was amazed that uh, he was introduced by his father-in-law, and that's got to be scary. <laughs> I, I don't think I'd ever want to be introduced by my father-in-law. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, Daniel, uh, we appreciate you coming to speak to us again, and his. Uh, topic is Christ confronted error about the new birth. Again, it's a pleasure to be with you and to have an opportunity to discuss the subjects that we're dealing with. Christ, the great controversialist. He always taught the right thing in the right way, at the right time to the right people with the right attitude. Never did anything wrong in the process of it, yet they crucified him. You think about that. It should not amaze us that we, poor, simple human beings, imperfect as we are, should be attacked, ridiculed, mocked, uh, treated in a hateful way by those who do not love the cause of Christ. Because uh, the one who loved it more than any other, the one who was willing even to lay his life for it, life down for it, they hated him. And so uh, it shouldn't surprise us. In fact, he taught the same thing. He said if they have... Uh, hated me, they're going to hate you also. And uh, if they'll receive my word, they'll receive your word. That is, if you teach the truth, you teach what he taught. And we're going to face that. And that's just the way it is. That's going to cause confrontation. Error does not like being exposed to the light of day. It had rather, uh, the false teachers would rather be able to sneak around, slip around, confuse and uh, mislead people, deceive people, uh, especially we're talking about willful false teachers, than uh, come out in the open and actually deal with things straight up. Christ confronted error about the new birth. And uh, he is still confronting error about the new birth because his word's not changed. 
Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away, never pass away. And uh, that same word still teaches today what it taught then. It refutes now what it refuted then. In fact, it refuted doctrines that were at that time even non-existent. Uh, one of the beauties of the Word of God, it is al almost as though God uh, anticipated every conceivable false doctrine or idea that would ever arise when it was given. And uh, as Brother Guy and Woods used to uh, urge, said, well, if you know the book, if you know the Word of God, you have no, nothing to fear concerning false teachers or what may arise uh, in time. In John 3, verse 3, Jesus said, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5, he explains further. Except a man is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. There are three key implications I want to bring to your attention relative to those two verses. First, the new birth, that is being born again, entails being born of water and the Spirit. Second, no one is a child of God that is a Christian, one who has been born again, uh, without being born of water and of the Spirit. He must have experienced both, or both must have been involved in the birth in order for him to be a child of God. And third, there are two elements then involved in the new birth, water and the Spirit. Here we have uh, a construction that involves uh, two genitive phrases modified by one preposition and telling us how we are born again, how we experience the new birth. Also, we need to understand the implication or the force of an accept statement in Greek. The word accept, both in Greek and English for that matter, simply means if and only if. In other words, there's no other option. It's either this way or not at all. There is only one door into the church of Christ. And that door is by way of the new birth. And whatever it entails, whatever it involves, that is what is absolutely essential to enter into the church that we read of in the New Testament. The kingdom of God and the church are one and the same in this world. That is the very nature of it, Matthew 16, 18, and 19. It is not surprising to find that those who were in the church at Colossae were also said to be in the kingdom of God's dear Son, Colossians 1, 12, and 13. Those who were in the church at Thessalonica were in the uh, church of God, or in the uh, kingdom of God, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And uh, even John, the apostle, and those to whom he was writing in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, were in the kingdom together. They were fellow companions in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. And so those who are in the church are in the kingdom. Those who are in the kingdom are in the church, one and the same. And uh, you can follow that out with a number of other arguments we don't have time to go into. But uh, there are a number of ways to show that the kingdom and the church, when we're talking about God's government in the world today, spiritual government, are one and the same. The kingdom simply describes the government of that institution, the body of Christ, the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now the central text concerning the Lord's teaching on the new birth is John 3. Verses 1 through 12, we've given the two main verses that deal with the nature of the new birth, verses 3 and 5. And uh, we need to understand the significance of this statement 
in view of things that have gone on and are going on in the religious world. This text is one of the most abused, one of the most misused in the religious world. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about, make a reference to, well, I'm a born-again Christian. And as though there's anything other than that. As though you can be a Christian and not be born again. Or you can be born again without being a Christian. The fact of the matter is you cannot be either without being both. That's simply the nature of it. If you're a Christian, you've been born again. And that's why you're a Christian. You've been born into the spiritual family of the God of heaven. And if you are a uh, one who has been born again, then you are necessarily a Christian, a disciple of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, a child of, of the living God. And so that's one thing that's refuted right to begin with by what the, the Lord taught. If, you're not, if you haven't been born again, you're not in the kingdom. If you're not in the kingdom, you're not in the church. If you're not in the church, you're not in Christ. If you're not in Christ, you haven't received the remission of sins, which is in Christ, Ephesians 1, 7. If you haven't received the remissions of, of sins, then you're not saved, Mark 16, 16. It's that simple. And so if someone says, I'm a Christian, but I haven't been born again, they're automatically admitting that they really aren't what they, cl they claim to be. They're not a Christian. If they have been born again, then they must be a Christian. If they're a Christian, they have been born again. But in looking at the subject, we need to understand that one of the things Jesus deals with is the fact that uh, the new birth is not another physical birth. This is uh, where Nicodemus uh, sort of misses the uh, boat in his understanding of the matter. In looking at John 3, verse 4, after Jesus had said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He was thinking in a physical, material way. He's thinking of a physical birth. Well, clearly, it's not another physical birth, and Jesus deals with that in verse 5 by pointing out that you must be born of water and of the Spirit. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God, and he goes on to say, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. I'm not talking about a physical birth, I'm, uh, a fleshly birth, I'm talking about a spiritual birth. And he illustrates that with the nature of the wind and describing how you see the effect of the wind, and therefore you know that the, the wind is, uh, is in operation. But he's talking spiritually and talking about a spiritual birth. So Nicodemus's idea was answered, refuted. And by the way, he goes on to point out, Nicodemus, you ought to know better than this. You ought to understand what I'm talking about. You're a teacher in Israel. The reason is you can go back to the Old Testament and find passages that stress the idea of a coming spiritual birth. Now, the particulars are not given. The details are not laid out in the Old Testament prophets, but they nonetheless hint at a time when there would be such a birth. Further, John the baptizer was carrying out his mission, his work, and he was teaching a uh, teaching that they were to believe on the one who was coming after, that is the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And he was even practicing a baptism of repentance, a sophos and harmartion, unto the remission of sins. Baptizing them in order for them to have their sins remitted. He was working in anticipation of the establishment of that kingdom. Preparing the way for it, preparing the material, preparing the people and laying out the foundation upon which Jesus the Christ, or laying out the material, you might say, the basic building blocks that Jesus, from which Jesus would then build the church. The church did not exist as an ordinal body, as a fact, until Christ himself built it. That's why in Matthew 16, verse 18, he speaks 
uh, uses the future tense upon this rock, I will build my church. wasn't built by John. John helped prepare the material. Jesus is the one that built it. That's why it's the church of Jesus Christ, the, uh, the church of Christ, the churches of Christ, Romans 16, 16, when you're talking about congregations, rather than the church of John the Baptist or the Baptist church. At any event, John was preparing the way. And keep in mind, Nicodemus obviously believed in John, believed what John was doing. Nicodemus himself was uh, an individual who demonstrated faith in Christ. Go back to John 3 verse 2. He says, We know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do the things that thou doest, do the, the, the works that thou doest, except God be with him. He recognized that Christ was at the very least a prophet or a teacher sent from God. And surely he was also familiar with what John was saying about Christ. Particularly John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And so he had some inkling as to what would be involved in the new birth early on through the ministry of John and also the, earth, the earthly ministry of Christ himself. So he should have known something uh, more about this, that we were dealing with a spiritual birth rather than a physical. Today we have folks, believe it or not, uh, New Agers and even emerging church people who are teaching that uh, John 3, 3 and 5 are the lost teaching of Jesus concerning reincarnation. There are websites dedicated to that. Some of the emerging church people who are in, call themselves evangelicals are teaching this type of stuff. That Jesus taught reincarnation. Hogwash. Reincarnation involves a, spirit, a physical birth. He's not talking about a physical birth. And he refutes that notion. Pay attention to the context, to the text, and to everything leading up to it. Destroys that world without end. Then there are those, and this is a very prominent view we still run into. You think you, we've beaten it down, gotten rid of it. There are some that teach that the water refers to the original birth and then the spirit to the spiritual birth, that there are really two births under consideration here. And that's simply not the case at all. Go back and look at it again. Verse 3, except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, you've got, to see, you've got to be born again to see the kingdom of God. Then you have Nicodemus' questions. Jesus then answers verse 5, which is an explanation of what he meant by what he said in verse 3. How do I know what Jesus meant verse 3? Read verse 5. He says, except a man be born of water and, what does that word and mean? And, if I say Sean and Danny go out the door, does that mean that Sean didn't go out the door but Danny did? No, it means that both of them went out the door, didn't it? That's the idea. Both the water and the spirit are essential. Birth by the water and the spirit is essential in order for one to enter into the kingdom of God. Now back up to verse 3. This is parallel then to the new birth. Both being born of water and of the Spirit is essential to seeing the kingdom of God, thus entering the kingdom of God. Those are co-equal phrases. In other words, you must have both. Both are absolutely essential to enter the kingdom of God. Both are also involved in being born again. Being born again is being born of water and of the Spirit. It is an absurdity. Linguistically, doctrinally, however you want to phrase it. To say that the water is a physical birth and thus not part of the new birth. While the Spirit is. Being born of the Spirit is the spiritual birth and is the new birth. And that's really what they're saying. 
The fact of the matter is the water, being born of the water and the spirit are both part of the new birth. They're both part of being born again. You cannot separate them. Both are essential to the case. The implication of this doctrine is that at the very point of conception, every human being, if you were to grant this just for argument's sake, and that's what we're going to do, just for argument's sake, every human being at the point of conception is already half born again. He's already half, halfway to, to, as a Christian. Now, which half? <laughs> half born again. Half, he's half saved. He's already half in the kingdom. That's just foolishness. The fact of the matter is, the word, and, and interestingly, they try to say the waters, the, the bag of waters, refer in the woman's womb. The fact of the matter is, that bag of waters is not literally water. Yes, it's a liquid, but it's an amniotic fluid that, can, that is primarily uh, consists of uh, fetal urine. It's not water. And the interesting thing about this is the majority of the people that take this position to try to get around being born of water because they, they want to avoid water baptism, the people that make that argument claim, oh, we believe in taking the Bible literally. Oh, really? Why not here? It is simply because they want to reject a priori the idea of water baptism being essential to salvation. They'll con concoct anything. And grammatically, that just won't hold up. It won't hold up grammatically. It won't hold up linguistically. If you're going to take it literally, then it would not be a literal physical birth. Because a literal physical birth involves amniotic fluid, not water. If we're going to do that, then let's be consistent. But the fact of the matter is, they don't care to be consistent. The most prominent doctrine, and I'm going to come back to this in just a moment, is that of the Deaver doctrine currently, and it's also a doctrine that we see a number of other false teachers teaching that... Uh, the new birth entails water baptism plus spirit baptism. We're going to come back to that. Just want to briefly mention another one. Some try to say that the water represents the spirit. And they take the construction water and the spirit as a Hindiotis construction. And they read it this way. They say it means the water, even the spirit. You're born of water, even the Spirit. And so it's just Holy Spirit baptism, and they get the water out altogether. They say the water symbolizes the Spirit. Well, number one, again, the people that make this argument, nine times out of ten, claim to be literalists. And yet, what do they do with the word water? They spiritualize it, get it out of the text, in order to arrive at a conclusion they wanted to reach start with. The second problem they have with it, they try to impose upon that text, they, they go out of the context and try to impose upon it passages from the Old Testament that are clearly figurative, that do not address this particular text. And so that's the second problem. The third problem is, this is not a Hindiotis construction. So, well, Brother Denham, you say that Titus 3.5 is a Hendiotis construction. Well, what do you mean Hendiotis? Hendiotis is saying the same thing two different ways. You can talk about something about remitting sins and pardoning sin. For instance, in the same construction. Maybe a phrase talks about pardoning, another phrase talks about forgiving. It's one and the same, the same idea. In... Uh, Daniel 70 weeks, for instance, there are six images that are used in one construction to describe atonement, the concept of atonement. It's atonement looked at from six different perspectives. That is a form of a Hendiotis-type construction. 
In Titus 3, 5, we have an hendiotis construction. We are saved through, the Greek says, dia. We are saved through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Well, how do you know that that is a Hendiotis construction? For this simple reason. The word regeneration and the word renewing are synonyms. They say the same thing. If you are renewed, you're regenerated in the Bible. If you're regenerated, you're renewed. They're not two separate actions. They're just describing the same action. Slightly from a different perspective. In the Bible, if the individual has been regenerated, he's been renewed. His spirit's made new. If he's been renewed, his spirit's been regenerated, born again. They're synonyms. Water and spirit are not synonyms. Those denote different ideas. And so we don't have a Hindiotis construction. And on that basis, the whole thing collapsed. Now getting to the main thing I want to deal with the rest of our time. And that is this nonsense that the passage is dealing with water baptism plus spirit baptism. And Mac Deaver has become the most ardent proponent of this in recent times. And I have his book on the Holy Spirit before me. And uh, I want to read... His description of this process. Page 301. As a man's body is lowered in the water when it is submerged in the water, the Holy Spirit submerges that man's human spirit within himself to change his nature. And at the very precise moment when God considers that man no longer sinner but now saint, at that precise instant, the regenerating, uh, submerging spirit moves from the outside to the inside of that heart. And then he cites Titus 3.5, Galatians 4.6. Less than this we cannot write, more than this we do not know. Well, in reality, he doesn't even know that. He is dead wrong. But this is what he teaches. And this is the way he is reading John 3, 5. Except a man be baptized in water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now what's wrong with that? Except a man be baptized, uh oh, doesn't say baptized, does he? It says except a man be born of. Doesn't say be baptized in water and the Spirit. It says, be born of. The image is dealing with birth. The imagery there. Birth. Born of water and of the Spirit. The word born and the word baptized are not co-equal expressions, folks. Otherwise, take the word, wherever the word baptized is found in the New Testament, translate it born and see what you get. Or take the word born, wherever it appears in the New Testament, and translate it, baptize, and see what comes out. He is superimposing the idea of baptism. Well, isn't being born of water baptism? Doesn't that involve bat water baptism? Well, certainly. But you prove it not from that text. That text does not tell us how we're born of water. It just says we're born of water. You have to go elsewhere to find out what that involves. And the same is true of the expression being born of the Spirit. You don't find in that passage uh, a delineation as to what precisely is involved in the new birth. All you are told is that you're dealing with a spiritual birth that involves two key elements, water and Spirit. Their relationship to that birth is not revealed. Further revelation was necessary to make that known. Now, brethren, Mac once knew that. This is not that difficult to understand. Mac once understood that simple fact. You have to have help to confuse it. 
And that's exactly what he's done. He has confused it, muddled it, messed it up, and uh, made a complete mess out of it. The fact of the matter is that being born uh, does involve water baptism, but that is by virtue of further revelation such as Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, verse 38, Ephesians 5, 26, and other passages. Further revelation lets us know what's involved in the new birth. Mac has assumed his entire case here. Furthermore, Mac assumes also that we have here an order of operation construction. Well, what do you mean by that? We mean that he teaches, and we just read it here in three, on page 301, that you are immersed in water and then the Spirit immerses you. And that's really, he says, what John 3, 5 teaches in the context of his discussion of that passage. He said this is the order of things. Question. Does this construction demand or implicate, imply an order of operation? Let's use a similar construction. John 4, 24. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Does that involve an order of operation? That is, we worship God first in spirit and then later in truth? Who would take that position? So I says, well, it's in, in as opposed to of. Makes no difference. It's still a preposition governing an object. And that's the key point here. I don't care if you change it to worship of spirit and worship of truth. Change the nature of the preposition. Is it still an order of operation? The simple fact is this. Orders of operation are not expressed by way of of nouns of objects governed by prepositions. That's not how it's done. It is done by way of active verbs. Where is the action in a sentence generally? It's in the predicate. And what is the central part of the predicate? The verb! The verb! Not the object or the prepositional uh, constructions that are modifying the verb. That's not where the action is. The action's in the verb. The, the uh, prepositions, those uh, prepositional phrases, modify the action. They don't tell you what the action itself is by itself. It's in the verb. And there is nothing in the verb born that in and of itself implies an order of operation. It's not there. Now you want to know you want an example of an order of operation construction? Mark 16, 16 is classic. He that believeth, there's a part a participle, and is baptized, there's another participle, both used as verbs, as primary verbs, shall be saved. There's another verb that tells you the result or the end, the end point here. That's an order of operation construction. That's not complicated. The phrasing may sound complicated, but that's not complicated. Repent ye and be baptized every one of you. Repent ye, that's one action, and implies that there's something in addition to it. Be baptized there's the next action. And we know what that means. Mac knows what that means. Todd Deaver knows what that means. Waylon Deaver knows what that means. Marlon Kilpatrick knows what that means. They know exactly that that's an order of construction, an order of operation construction. They stand up every Sunday and preach it that way. They may not use that phraseology, but that's what they're telling people to do. Repent and then be baptized. 
They understand the force of it. And for them to stand up and butcher John 3, 5 the way they do is inexcusable for a gospel preacher of any experience. They ought to repent. I am not going to hold my breath, however. I hate blue face. And I've learned from dealing with some of them that they have made up their mind. They are willing to go to hell for this doctrine. And I do not say that lightly. If Matt is serious about upholding this, he can meet me in Denton, Texas in keeping with the agreement that he originally made. And if he cannot stand by his own agreement to start with, then you cannot trust him on anything. It is that simple. He knows on what basis I am willing to meet him and on what terms he must meet in order to uphold his own, own honesty and integrity in the matter. And if he's not willing to do that, then folks, then folks, there will be no debate. If you cannot trust that he would keep his original agreement, you cannot trust that he would keep any agreement. And it's that simple. But that's where he is. And by the way, and I want to make this point as we close out, our time's about gone. And I suspect this is one of two reasons, one of several reasons he does not want to debate. He has put too much in print. And he knows that we know what he has committed himself to. And he does not want to back up and say, I was wrong. On virtually any of it. It's always, well, I have a better understanding. I've advanced in my study, and I wasn't wrong in it. I just now have a better idea. Here's, let me listen to my new explanation. Oh, I was right when I said that. I just didn't fully understand all the implications of it. And that's what you get from me. It's not, I was wrong, I've changed my position. You won't come out and do that. Page 298. He says, Just like the passage in Acts 8, 36-39, the baptism in Romans 6 is viewed as both a burial and as a resurrection. It is a going down into something and a coming up out of that something. Jesus was buried and He arose. He came out of that in which He was buried. We are buried and we come out of that in which we are, we are buried. Okay. So far, so good. I mentioned to my opponent, he's talking about having a debate on baptism, that water is the only element in which a person can be baptized and from which he can arise without losing the benefit of it. And the point is, he was saying, well, Romans 6 dealing with water baptism. The passage, while it certainly would entail both elements involved, He's talking about water and spirit baptism. Specifically refers to an element from which a person arises to walk in newness of life. And so he's saying specifically water is being stressed there. Now catch this. If the spirit were the element specifically being referenced, then we have the difficulty of explaining how we are baptized in the spirit and then that we come out of the spirit. If we were to come out of the Spirit, we would lose the benefit or the effect of that element. Now catch the force of that. He says it's obviously dealing with water because water is the only element you can come out of and still have the benefits of. That is, you have the remission of sin. But you must continue to be immersed in the Spirit. So you can have the benefit. Now here's his problem. Here's his problem. That implies that you are never born again until you get to heaven. 
You're never re you never really completely experience the new birth until your feet are walking on the street of glory. Why? Because you've got to continue to have those benefits of the Spirit enveloping your human spirit. And, but listen to this. John 3, 5 says, Except if and only if a man is born of water and of the Spirit, Except he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You can't be in the kingdom unless you have received both immersions. And it has to be a complete operation. You have to have been born again. That involves a complete action. That means that you must be, that involves not only an end, to the immersion in water, but it implies also an end to the immersion in the Spirit. And that's the nature of the verb. Do you know who teaches the idea that uh, you only really born again when you go to heaven? Do you know who, where that doctrine comes from? You ever heard of a man named Herbert W. Armstrong? And his son, Garner Ted, welcome to the worldwide church of God, Mac. Because you're now teaching what, they're taught, what they taught. Basically, that's it. That the new birth. Now, keep in mind, if you're not in the kingdom yet, you're not in the church yet. Because the kingdom and the church are one and the same. If you're not in the church, you're not in Christ. If you're not in Christ, you haven't received the remission of sins, and you haven't been born again process isn't complete. Now this is the mess he's put himself in. This is the situation. And by the way, what's fascinating is, he says when you are immersed into the water, you receive the remission of sins anyway. And if you receive the remission of sins, then you have to be in Christ, you have to be in the church, and that is before you're immersed in the Spirit. He says you're to be immersed in the Spirit in order to be born again. You have to be immersed in the Spirit in order to be regenerated. Well, you already have the remission of sins. Now you need regeneration. But if you have the remission of sins, you're already in the kingdom. And if you're in the kingdom, then according to that, you had to experience the new birth. Well, to experience the new birth, then you had to have been born of water and of the Spirit. What a mess. You talk about confused. He is confused. But it is of his own doing. Nobody forced him into it. And he needs to repent of it. By the way, if you want to know what they did to be born again, read Acts 2. They all wound up in the church. If you do what they did, you'll be what they were. And you will have done what they did in order to be born again. It's that simple. Thank you. Let me make sure I understand. <laughs> like Kenneth prefaces some of his remarks sometimes, says, I'm just an old country boy and I ain't got much education. I want to make sure I, th there's a technical term I picked up from you, and I want to make sure I uh, apply it correctly. Uh, you use the term, so I want to ask, if I have it right, this term was hogwash? Hogwash. Hogwash. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, I have to ad admit that, uh, that the, the, the process here that brought back some memories, and in this case, some good ones, when back years, more years than I care to remember, that I sat in a college class with a good professor. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate it. We're adjourned till the bottom of the hour. Okay.